But I spent all my summers up here um, with my relatives, uh, almost all of whom were vets, uh, working class, lower working class. My grandfather spent the last 20 years of his life working in the post office in Mechanic Falls. Um, and at the age of 10, I won a scholarship to a very elite boarding school. Um, and so I had this bifurcated existence where I was going with the sons of the ultra-rich and then coming back to places like Mechanic Falls. And um, my, my hatred for the rich and authority comes out of that experience. <laughs> Um, because I understood, I mean, I went to school with, you know, the George Bushes, um, you know, these people who ha were given everything, and no matter how often they failed, there was always someone to pick them up. And I was very cognizant of the native intelligence of my own family who were never given any chances at all. Um, and I knew where my loyalty lay. Um, we used to have a, they were eccentrics without question, um, we used to have a wood lot up there, and uh, there was a lumber mill. I don't know if it's still there. One of my uncles, he was actually my mother's cousin, but was my, we call him uncle, ran. And um, he'd been a Marine in World War II. And one day he was driving with two of his workers in his truck with, of course, the gun rack in the back. He drives past the wood lot, and there's two guys from Massachusetts with chainsaws cutting down all our wood. And uh, he takes his shotgun, <laughs> out of the, off the gun rack with his two workers and he walks out in the wood lot and he clanks it up and loads it, flicks off the safety and goes, you guys have 10 to get out of here. One, two, three, and they, these Massachusetts guys dropped their chainsaws and ran. Well, the funny part is that they decided to take my uncle to court thinking they were gonna get justice in Mechanic Falls, Maine. And they went to court and of course they called up the two workers who had witnessed the event who were in my uncle's truck and they go, nope, we didn't see nothing. <laughs> so you may have seen the hit piece I, that was in the New Republic, and you can get from Stan my response, which was sent out today. But as soon as I read it, I said, man, I wish I had my uncles. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wrote a book, and if anybody wants to know about it, we'll talk about it afterwards. I don't want to fill up the talk with it, but I'm happy to talk about it. it was, I, I spent many years covering the Middle East. I'm kind of numb to it after years of being attacked by AIPAC. Um, I wrote a book a couple years ago called Death of the Liberal Class. It started out as a book on the press. And uh, it's kind of a funny story. It, it was a good lesson for me as a writer. Um, never write a book that's somebody else's idea. Um, so. Knopf, which is a huge publishing house, went to uh, the former editor of the Washington Post, Len Downey, and said, well, will you write a book about it? He said, no, I don't want it. So then they went to the former editor of the New York Times, Joel Elliveld, and said, do you want it? And he said, no, I don't want it. And then, then they came to me. Um, and how they thought they would get a book on the press that looked anything like the book that they would get from the former editors of the New York Times, the Post, I don't know. And I turned in my manuscript, and uh, the editors read it, and they were appalled. Um, they uh, called up my agent and said, okay, well, we're going to publish it, but we're going to give it to an editor to take out all the negativity. <laughs> so you can imagine how that went down. Um, and I frantically searched around for another publisher. You get, you get half of your advance up front. And I frantically searched around for a publisher who would take the book. I, I got Nation Books to take it on the condition that they paid that half. They could have the whole book. Um, but in that transition, I began to think that it wasn't just the press as a liberal institution that had collapsed, but all of the pillars of the liberal establishment had collapsed. The Democratic Party, uh, education, and I suspect here at the University of Maine, like any state university, you are under assault from these forces, um, culture becoming completely commercialized. Um, and so I, the book transformed into a better book, uh, which asked that question, why? What happened? How did we get here? And it took me back to World War I. Because on the eve of World War I, 
we had powerful, radical, and populist movements that had attained that power through the blood of the American working class. The labor wars in the United States were the bloodiest in any industrialized country. Hundreds of workers in this country died for the 40-hour work week, for safe work conditions, for an end to child labor, for unions. Thousands were wounded. And my grandfather was in the main National Guard in the 30s. And uh, he would tell me that the Guard was called out to beat up strikers. And he had his old truncheon in the barn. And he had 23 nicks in it with his penknife, each nick for a communist that he'd hit. And that struggle, which Howard Zinn chronicles so movingly in the people's history of the United States, as you heard, I teach in a prison. And um, when you teach in a prison, it's the exact opposite of teaching in a university because in the, in the university setting, you're supposed to write in the course catalog something very sexy to entice the undergraduates, promise to show them a lot of movies and things like that. <laughs> when you're in a prison, it's, you've got to get it through the prison authority, so you've got to write something completely innocuous and boring. So the class before this one, I submitted a proposal to teach American history, the Constitution, our founding fathers, the system of government, which flew through, and then I bought uh, every prisoner a copy of Howard Zinn's The People's History of the United States. <laughs> now, I never met Zinn, unfortunately. I've always admired him. I mean, his book, Politics and History, is brilliant. And um, when I would, so it's African-American, poor African-American men who've never been taught their own history, and Zinn is very cognizant throughout that book of the African-American experience and the African-American struggle and um, what was moving was to watch how the their own story, the story of Frederick Douglass, the story of Sojourner Truth, the story of John Brown, um, that ignited a passion within them. And I would be giving a talk, I would give 90 minute talks on each section of the book each week, and, and I would hear from the classroom, damn, damn, we've been lied to. And Zinn captured in that book something absolutely vital about us. And that is that this system was constructed in such a way as to disenfranchise all but the moneyed, propertyed, and mostly slaveholding elite. And I just did a talk in New York with Rick Wolf and Cornell West on Thomas Paine, we're doing, we, one of the things that all of us found among the Occupy movement is that there wasn't a kind of literacy among a lot of the kids in the movement about the radicals of the past. So we started with Thomas Paine, who's a kind of perfect example. Uh, and the only reason that the, uh, the Whigs made an alliance with Paine is because in Pennsylvania, uh, that old, none of that pre-war elite defected to American independence. It was the only state where the post-war elite was completely new. And it was a very uncomfortable alliance with Paine because Paine was an abolitionist and quite presently said that um, Americans could not call for liberty until they call for liberty for African Americans and that it was a kind of poison within the body politic, which of course we paid for with 600,000 lives um, in the Civil War. Uh, and so as soon as the revolution was over, Paine was publicly vilified, driven out. Um, I mean, just an amazing life. Ends up in France, denounces the French terror, ends up in prison. They want to execute him. There's a scene where they bring Danton into the Luxembourg prison, and they embrace right before Danton is guillotined, and dies in utter obscurity, forgotten, and uh, poverty in New York City. And six people come to his funeral, and two of them are black. Um, and he's the most important, maybe the only American revolutionist. Um, I mean, common sense, uh, age of reason, writes a man, these were, these sold hundreds of thousands of copies, which he never took money for because he wanted people to read them. Uh, all, that whole system was designed in such a way uh, through the Senate, senators were appointed, through the disenfranchising of women, uh, of course, Native Americans, African Americans, people without property, 
And everything that we got, we fought for and paid for with tremendous suffering and sacrifice. So all of these movements, which never achieved power, as Zinn points out, whether it was the Liberty Party that fought slavery, the suffragists who fought for women's rights, um, the labor movement, the old wobblies, the Communist Party, who we utterly erased from history. If you were an African American in the 1920s, like Paul Robeson, the only place where you were accepted as an equal was in the Communist Party. Uh, even Debs, the reason the Pullman strike fails is because uh, in the end, the white railroad workers would not unite with the black railroad workers. Uh, and all of these movements opened up the space. On the eve of World War I, anarchists, uh, we had hundreds of anarchist journals in a variety of languages, Yiddish, German, Lithuanian, uh, Emma Goldman, Berkman, of course the Haymarket martyrs, um, and, and what happened was the war. Wilson, who had run for re-election in 1916 on the, on the slogan, he kept us out of the war, begins to feel tremendous pressure from Wall Street because with the collapse of the Tsarist front, of, the, of uh, the Eastern Front, the Kaiser had the capacity to move 51 divisions back to the Western Front. And if you remember that last summer, there was a huge push where they broke through the lines. And the bankers who had lent tremendous sums to the British and the French knew that if they lost the war, they'd never be repaid. Now, this country had a strong tradition of isolationism, but that's really a misnomer. It, it was a strong tradition of pacifism. And Wilson, after 30 days, had to call up conscription because nobody would volunteer to serve. Um, there's a great line from Thoreau, you probably know it, you know, how about how soldiers are not educated because if they really were educated, they'd all desert. So when Wilson goes to make the announcement from the White House to the Congress, he has to be protected by an entire troop of cavalry because of fear of anarchist bombs. And there's a fascinating debate. I went into the Princeton archives and read the papers of Lippmann and Ballard and others who were... There was a debate between Wilson and the, the kind of intellectual elite and Lippmann embodying it in his book, Public Opinion, which is a kind of blueprint for control. That's where the term manufacturing consent comes out of public opinion, which Chomsky, who I just saw last Thursday at MIT, and Herman write his great book on the press, Manufacturing Consent. And Lippmann says to Wilson, Wilson wants to immediately pass the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act and shut everything down through force. And Lippmann said, no, we can create a system of mass propaganda that effectively pulls everyone into the war effort. And that's how you get the Committee for Public Information, the first system of modern mass propaganda in human history. Because it employed the understanding of crowd psychology pioneered by figures like Le Bon, Trotter, and Sigmund Freud. That people are not moved by fact or reason. They're moved by the skillful manipulation of emotion. And Hollywood starts churning out these movies like The Kaiser, The Butcher of Berlin, 45,000, they call them Three Minute Men, Fanny Now, graphics artists, and then they create their own news division. Every publication had to be pro-war in its stance, which the masses wouldn't accept and shut down for the war. Appeal to Reason, a socialist journal, had the fourth highest circulation in the country, does accept and prints pro-war editorials. And then you have that recalcitrant minority, uh, Jane Addams, Randolph Bourne, and the great Eugene V. Debs, who Wilson detested, which is why uh, when Wilson uh, wouldn't even give him amnesty after he put him in prison for opposing the draft, and it was Harding who finally let him out. Um, and it's fascinating to read people like Adams and Bourne at that moment, because they despair not only of the populace, which has been seduced into the war effort, but of the intellectual class that has been seduced as well. That liberal elite who went from, uh, you know, the, the uh, community houses that have been created on the Lower East Side, the settlement houses, uh, turning that kind of grounded idealism into this abstract idealism of supporting the war that would end all war.
And what happened after the war, and Dwight McDonald, who's a writer that is not read at much but should be, brilliant writer, and if you know anything about Chomsky, McDonald, um, uh, I think he married into some money, and so for five years he printed this journal called Politics, right a after World War II, um, until he went broke. And he was publishing Betelheim and Hannah Aaron and George Orwell and I mean, all sorts of great stuff. And Chomsky, credit, he never had a circulation above 5,000. Chomsky credits that journal with his political awakening, um, which is always the importance of serious ideas. Of, of, and he writes, McDonald writes this great essay called Mass Cult, Mid Cult. And he said, the problem with the intellectual class is that it seeks a popular audience and dilutes its intellectual message thinking that the importance is numbers. It's never numbers. The fact is that that journal, because of its sophistication and depth, was training, without question, the most important intellectual in the United States, which is Chomsky. Um, so McDonald says, what happened at the end of the war was seismic, because two things went on. First, the Committee for Public Information which produced Edward Bernays, the father of modern public relations, Laswell, and others. When the war is over, it goes straight to Madison Avenue and starts working on behalf of corporations as well as the government. When the 1954 coup, they hire Bernays' PR firm. But the other thing that happened, which McDonald wrote about, was that we immediately entered the, what he calls the psychosis of permanent war. And he says none of the political theorists of the 19th century, including Karl Marx, grasped this phenomena, the psychosis of permanent war. The only time Marx, I think, writes about war is in the Franco-Prussian War, and he hopes the Germans will win because then the workers' re rebellion or you know, state will happen more quickly. Um, and that, uh, that psychosis of permanent war, where instantly the dreaded Hun becomes the dreaded Red, was used to break the movements that had before, right on the eve of the war, pushed the business class and the oligarchs and the elites up against the wall. So after the war, you see the heavy use of the sedition and the espionage act. You see the Berkman and Goldman are deported. The masses are shut down, appeal to reason, even though they played the game, are shut down. The wobblies are broken. Um, so that by the 1920s, the labor movement is obliterated. And it resurrects itself in the 30s with the breakdown of capitalism. And, and that is an important moment in, hum, in, in American history because it shows, and this is something Chomsky has pointed out, how a functioning liberal class is supposed to behave. A functioning liberal class, it, the liberal class was never designed to be the left. The liberal class was designed as the safety valve so that when capitalism breaks down, you can ameliorate the capitalist system to keep it afloat. And Roosevelt said, my greatest achievement was that I saved capitalism. And the only reason a liberal class will function is because it has pressure from the populist and radical movements that remain fast to a moral imperative, but that never achieve power. Um, so much of the New Deal came out of the populist party, came out of those radical movements. And what happens after World War II is that those radical movements are finally destroyed. And I don't know if you know this, Stan bought my house in Norway, but um, the, I believe the only meeting of the Communist Party in uh, Norway, Maine, took place on my former front yard. <laughs> By, f uh, it was hell, it was, he, they were invited into Norway by Freeland Howe, who was the brother of the guy who owned the house, um, who was, ran a music shop in Norway and was a card-carrying member of the Communist Party. And the famous story is George Howe, his eccentric brother who owned the house and called it Summit Study and stood up there and like fed birds and he was a naturalist and he used to take kids out on uh, overnight trips and he, he, he was an amazing geologist. And, but uh, I was looking at the journals and the historical society, and they're all around the campfire eating mushrooms. <laughs> so, um, and Howe walked down into the field and uh, came back and reportedly said, there's nobody down there I'd trust the government with. 
um, after the 50s, we saw with McCarthy the destruction, the final destruction. And Ellen Schrecker, the really great historian, has written two very good books on this. One is called No Ivory Tower, which is how academia was purged. And the other, I think it's called Such Were the Crimes. Um, but it was an eye-opening book for me because when we know about those figures like Charlie Chaplin or Pete Seeger, but we know about the, you know, the, the, uh, the elites, the writers who were blacklisted. But in fact, the, the really pernicious damage of, of the Red Scare in the 50s was that the FBI, and let's not forget why the FBI was formed in 1908. Um, the FBI was basically a goon squad uh, that was sent in to break radical movements, to spy on them, uh, to blackmail them, um, and that's, of course, all J. Edgar Hoover did, all the way up to Martin Luther King calling him in his hotel room before the Nobel Prize trying to get him uh, to commit suicide. But the FBI would go into, like, public high schools and give them a list of six or seven teachers who were deemed to be sympathetic or red, and they would be instantly dismissed. There was never any evidence and they would be blacklisted. They could never teach again. And they destroyed all sorts of organizations, including the Union for Social Workers, which used to be a very radical union in this country, and which not only uh, fought for the working conditions of social workers, but actually uh, organized on behalf of their clients. All of this was destroyed. Our, our, one of our greatest journalists, I.F. Stone, uh, becomes a pariah. And can't even get a job at the nation and ends up uh, running IF Stone's weekly uh, out of his basement. And at that point, we essentially were disarmed. And uh, all, that's how we have seen all of, starting 1948 with the uh, Taft-Hartley Act, which until NAFTA was the worst piece of legislation for American workers, making it very difficult to organize. Um, we saw step by step the New Deal, all of the advances of the New Deal destroyed, unions broken. We now, less than 12% of American workers are unionized. Most of them are public service employees who can't, don't even have the right to strike. Um, uh, and we began to shift from what the Harvard historian Charles Mayer calls an empire of production, where we actually produce things, to an empire of consumption where both the empire and the individuals within it were borrowing frantically to maintain a lifestyle and an empire they could no longer afford. And with a rise in that shift, we give birth to the monstrosities of the faux liberal, embodied in particular by Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Those who speak that traditional feel your pain language of liberalism and yet betray all of the core values that the liberal wing of the Democratic Party once did care about, including labor. So it's under Clinton that you get NAFTA, which is the greatest betrayal of the working class since Taft-Harley. It's under Clinton that you get the destruction of the welfare system. And at the time the welfare system was destroyed, 70% of those receiving welfare were children. It's under Clinton that you get the omnibus bill, which explodes the prison population and turns the mass incarceration of this country into a business where a poor person of color's body is worth nothing on the streets, but behind bars is worth forty or fifty thousand dollars a year to prison contractors and phone companies um, and prison guard companies and private prisons. It's under Clinton that you get the deregulation of the FCC, which permits roughly a half dozen corporations, Viacom, General Electric, Rupert Murdoch's News Corp, Disney, Clear Channel, to seize the airways. 90, about 90% 90 of what Americans watch and listen to is controlled by these handful of corporations. And it's under Clinton that you get the destruction of the uh, commercial banking industry, the ripping down of the firewalls, turning commercial and investment banks into big hedge funds, precipitating the bank crisis and the global meltdown. And at that point, we enter 
the period that we're living in now, which is, in essence, a kind of political paralysis. The Democratic Party, in essence, became the Republican Party, and it was kind of an effective tactic because the Republican Party just became lunatic. Every promise, I mean, you know, the public relations industry is quite skillful and pernicious. I think it's maybe the most evil industry short of the arms industry in the country. They know what we want. I mean, they, they know what we want to hear. We were fed it in 2008. I mean, this is the real tragedy of Obama, is that he had a popular mandate to institute real change. And Obama served the centers of corporate power from the beginning, rather than the people who elected him. The, the assault on civil liberties under Obama is much more egregious than under George W. Bush. The FISA Amendment Act, and you know, I was a plaintiff in uh, Clapper versus Amnesty International, which got to the Supreme Court. And the government lawyers in the court proceedings, this was before Snowden, said that none of us, that all of our charges of mass surveillance were speculation. Um, that, in fact, if the government was surveilling any of us as plaintiffs, we would be told. And it was only after Snowden that we know that absolutely all of us are being surveilled. And none of us were being told. Uh, and what happened in... Um, Stan mentioned the NDAA, for those of you who don't know it, Section 1021 of the NDAA signed into law by Obama on New Year's Eve 2012, when he hoped no one was looking, um, permits the U.S. military overturning, I think, 140 or 170 years of domestic law, permits the U.S. military to seize American citizens who are deemed to substantially support, that's not a legal term, it's not material support, substantially support Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or something called associated forces, another nebulous term. Hold them in military facilities indefinitely and strip them of due process. So uh, with the great lawyers, Carl Mayer and Bruce Afron, we uh, sued the president. We went to federal court, the Southern District Court of New York, and we won um, with very courageous judge, Catherine B. Forrest, who wrote a 112-page opinion, which is worth reading. Um, she does an amazing job of explicating that law. And she actually brings up the internment of the 110,000 Japanese Americans in World War II, saying that with a law like this, you essentially have the capacity to criminalize an entire group of people, which is, of course, why they wrote it. Uh, and the reaction of the Obama administration was fascinating. They, on the day of the ruling, the government lawyers, who were now suddenly accompanied by Pentagon lawyers, showed up and demanded that the temporary injunction that Judge Forrest had set, in essence invalidating the law, be removed until the appeal at the Second Circuit, the next highest court, could be heard. And Judge Forrest, to her credit, refused. So this was on a Friday. Mon Nine o'clock Monday morning, those government lawyers go to the Second Circuit, the appellate court in New York, and make the same request in the name of national security. And the Second Circuit, unfortunately, puts the law back into effect. Now, why? I mean, we knew they'd appeal, but why were they that aggressive? And I think the only supposition that I and the lawyers have is they're already using the law. Because if they're holding dual Pakistani U.S. nationals in Bagram or somewhere else, and that injunction was allowed to stand, they would be in contempt of court. So the appellate court, after they did our hearing, didn't rule until Clapper. And then they used Clapper to say, Hedges doesn't have standing in Clapper, therefore he doesn't have standing in the lawsuit against the NDAA. And that allowed the court to essentially avoid having to rule on the issue. Because the stripping of due process and the use of the military to carry out extraordinary rendition, 
of American citizens cannot be defended constitutionally. It is an egregious, stark violation of our constitutional right to due process and to the prohibition of the military as a policing force on American streets. Why? Why do we have wholesale surveillance? Why do we have the NDAA? Why has the Obama administration used the Espionage Act eight times to shut down whistleblowers, people like Thomas Drake, uh, Snowden, of course, has been hit with this. Uh, and, and, and the combination of the Espionage Act coupled with wholesale surveillance, and we are the most photographed, monitored, eavesdropped, uh, recorded population in human history. So, and I covered the Stasi state in East Germany. Um, why are these, why are they, why is it all coming together? And I think it's because in all of the scenarios that they run, they understand that the galloping effects of climate change, coupled with a prolonged economic stagnation, and maybe we're not in a depression, but we're certainly in a stagnant economy. I mean, real wages have, have either remained stagnant or declined since uh, the early 1970s means there will be some kind of blowback. They know something's coming. And they are preparing both the legal and physical mechanisms for a response. It's why all these police departments are getting uh, Kevlar jackets and long-barreled weapons and APCs. And I mean, if you, if you do, a SWAT team does a drug bust in Oakland uh, in the middle of the night, kicks down their doors, everybody's dressed in black, they've got M16s, there's command to command, uh, APC outside, there may even be a helicopter. There's no difference between that and a night raid in Fallujah. And that's what always happens that within empire, that the, the techniques for control on the outer reaches of empire migrate back into the heart of empire. And empires always collapse internally. They hollow themselves out from the inside, which is what we're doing to our universities, to our infrastructure, in the name of austerity. Um, and at this point, the mechanism, the liberal establishment, the, the institutions that, as Karl Popper wrote, makes piecemeal or incremental reform possible, that capacity that Roosevelt had to adjust the system to save capitalism is gone. And as Karl Marx rightly said, unregulated, unfettered capitalism is a revolutionary force. Because without self-imposed limits, it commodifies everything. Human beings become commodities, the natural world becomes a commodity that it then exploits until exhaustion or collapse. And that's why the environmental crisis is intimately twinned with the economic crisis. 40% of the summer Arctic sea ice melts, and Shell Oil looks at it as a business opportunity dropping half billion, the death throes of the planet. In theological terms, these corporate forces are forces of death. And they will sacrifice the next generation and succeeding generations for short-term profit. And there is now no capacity we have through the formal systems of power to ameliorate or to protect ourselves from a rapacious corporate capitalism, a global neo-feudalism, which is supranational. It has no, they're not like the Mellons or the Rockefellers or uh, the Carnegies or, uh, they, don't, they don't have any loyalty to the nation state. I mean, these people at least physically were men, you may have been shooting everybody in Ludlow and uh, Homestead, but they were physically within the nation. Now it's gone, it's dissipated. Um, you have most of what's produced, produced in Dickinsonian sweatshops in Bangladesh or, or southern China. And we have in many ways gone back to the horrific conditions of labor that we saw in the 19th century. Um, there's a very fine book 
uh, by, I think, our greatest living philosoph uh, political philosopher, Sheldon Wolin, called Democracy Incorporated, which I urge you to read. And Wolin, in the book, describes the system that has been created as inverted totalitarianism. By that, he means it's not classical totalitarianism. It doesn't find its expression through a demagogue or a charismatic leader, but through the anonymity of corporations. That in a classical totalitarian regime, you have a reactionary or revolutionary force that will overthrow a structure and replace it. In inverted totalitarianism, you have corporate forces that purport to pay fealty to electoral politics, the iconography and language of American patriotism, the Constitution, and yet internally have seized all of the levers of power as to render the citizen impotent. And it doesn't matter at that point what the citizens want. The citizens made it very clear to Obama what they wanted. And Obama, who, unlike his predecessor, is intelligent, understood I, I sort of blame Obama more because I think Bush was just kind of clueless. Um, actually, I went to prep school with so many Bushes, I can assure you he's clueless. Um, but Obama isn't clueless. And there, you know, in some ways, you know, there's something deeply cynical about Obama um, because he knows where the centers of power lie and he serves those centers of power at our expense. I, uh, was um, participated, as you know, in the Occupy movement. And um, I think the reason the Occupy movement frightened the power elite so much is because it was a majoritarian movement, that they all thought they were radicals. But in fact, all, on all of the issues, and we know from the polling, uh, on all of the issues that they expressed the majority of American citizens were with them. Whether it was rational health care, whether it was uh, jobs, whether it was green energy. Uh, and, and in Zuccotti, on the weekends, you would uh, see families come in from the suburbs, from New Jersey or Hoboken or somewhere, and they'd be pushing the strollers you know, with their kids up and down the park. And I think that terrified the power elite. Uh, which is why, under the direction of Barack Obama, there was a coordinated federal effort to eradicate those encampments. Now, the eradication of those encampments, politically, I think, were dangerous. These were nonviolent movements that expressed a legitimate grievance. And, you know, it was, it was primarily driven by what Bakunin would call day class, say intellectuals, the sons and daughters, white, of the middle class, who were beginning to suffer what people of color in marginal communities have been suffering for decades. Um, and in, in terms of you know, not being able to find meaningful employment, sustainable employment, uh, police abuse, um, all of that was new to these kids. Um, but that, that's a very volatile moment, as Bakunin points out, in a society, when you have that fusion and, and, and you know, this was a dispute between Bakunin and Marx. Bakunin was right that no revolution is actually propagated by the poor. Um, it's actually driven by those day class, say, intellectuals. Those people who have been risen uh, and trained and educated for a position within the elite of society, relatively the elite in society, but find there's no place for them. And uh, at that point, um, you have revolutionary tinder. Paul Krugman writes frequently about a rational response to the economic crisis. And, um, and he's right, we should have a rational response. But if you look at Occupy, what, if you're trying to keep the equilibrium of your society, what would have been a rational response? A rational response would have been a moratorium on foreclosures and bank repossessions, a forgiveness of all student debt, a massive jobs program, especially targeted at people under the age of 25, and a rational health care system, the public option, universal health care for all, as a right. In moral terms, we live in a country where it is legally permissible 
for corporations, pharmaceutical insurance corporations, to hold sick children hostage while their parents bankrupt themselves trying to save their sons or daughters. Capitalists should never be allowed anywhere near a healthcare system. And the game that was played, Obamacare is Romney care. It was written in the Heritage Foundation, it was adopted in 2006 by Romney, and then it was, you know, with Liz Fowler, who's working for Baucus, who's now making millions, going back, having done her job for the insurance companies. It was written by Fowler. The, the difference between Obamacare and Romney Care is that written into Obamacare was $447 billion in subsidies for the pharmaceutical and insurance industry, the equivalent of the bank bailout bill for the pharmaceutical and insurance industry. And that was the game. That is the classic game that was played, as if there was any real substantial difference. When I uh, was in Zuccotti, Cornell West and I held um, a people's hearing at Goldman Sachs. And uh, we brought uh, unemployed public school teachers and single mothers who'd been evicted with their children from their home. Um, and then we marched on Goldman Sachs. And I want to close by reading a little section I wrote in this book, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, uh, on that day, on that march. Faces appeared to me moments before protesters from Occupy Wall Street and I were arrested on a windy November afternoon in front of Goldman Sachs. They were not the faces of the smug Goldman Sachs employees who peered at us through the revolving glass doors and lobby windows, a pathetic collection of middle-aged fraternity and sorority members. They were not the faces of the blue uniform police with their dangling plastic handcuffs or the thuggish Goldman Sachs security personnel whose buzz cuts and dead eyes reminded me of the Stasi. They were not the faces of the demonstrators around me, the ones with massive student debts and no jobs, the ones weighed down by their broken dreams, the ones whose anger and betrayal triggered the street demonstrations and occupations for justice. They were not the faces of the onlookers, the construction workers who seemed cheered by the march on Goldman Sachs, or the suited businessmen who did not. They were far away faces. They were the faces of children dying. They were tiny, confused, bewildered faces I had seen in the southern Sudan, Gaza, the slums of Brazzaville, Nairobi, Cairo, Delhi, and the wars I covered. They were faces with large, glassy eyes above bloated bellies. They were the small faces of children convulsed by the ravages of starvation and disease. I carry these faces. They do not leave me. I look at my own children and cannot forget them these other children who never had a chance. War brings with it a host of horrors, but the worst is always the human detritus that war and famine leave behind. The small, frail bodies whose tangled limbs and vacant eyes condemn us all. The wealthy and the powerful, the ones behind the glass at Goldman Sachs, laughed and snapped pictures of us as if we were an odd lunchtime diversion from commodities trading, from hoarding and profit, from the collective sickness of money worship, as if we were creatures in a cage, which in fact we soon were. Goldman Sachs Commodities Index is the most heavily traded in the world. 
The financial firm hoards futures of rice, wheat, corn, sugar, and livestock, and jacks up commodity prices by as much as 200% on the global market so that poor families can no longer afford basic staples and literally starve. Hundreds of millions of poor in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America do not have enough to eat in order to feed this mania for profit. The technical jargon learned in business schools and on trading floors effectively masks the reality of what is happening, murder. The cold, neutral words of business and commerce are designed to make systems operate, even systems of death, with a ruthless efficiency. The people behind the windows and those of us with arms locked in a circle on the concrete outside do not speak the same language. Profit, trade, speculation, globalization, war, national security. These are the words they use to justify the snuffing out of tiny lives, acts of radical evil. The glass tower before us was filled with people carefully selected for the polish and self-assurance that comes with having been formed in institutions of privilege. Their primary attributes were lack of consciousness, a penchant for deception, aggressiveness, a worship of money, and an incapacity for empathy or remorse. And it is always the respectable classes, the polished Ivy League graduates, the prep school boys and girls who grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut, or Short Hills, New Jersey, who are the most susceptible to evil. To be intelligent, as many are, at least in a narrow, analytical way, is morally neutral. These respectable citizens are inculcated in their elitist ghettos with values and norms, including pious acts of charity used to justify their privilege and a belief in the innate goodness of American power. They are trained to pay deference to systems of authority. They are taught to believe in their own goodness, unable to see or comprehend, and are perhaps indifferent to the cruelty inflicted on others by the exclusive systems they serve. And as norms change, as the world is steadily transformed by corporate forces into a small cobble of predators and a vast herd of human prey, these elites seamlessly replace one set of values with another. These elites obey the rules. They make the system work, and they are rewarded for this. In return, they do not question. We seem to have lost, at least until the advent of the Occupy Wall Street movement, not only all personal responsibility, but all capacity for personal judgment. Corporate culture absolves all of responsibility. This is part of its appeal. It relieves all of moral choice. There is an unequivocal acceptance of the principles such as unregulated capitalism and globalization as a kind of natural law. The steady march of corporate capitalism requires a passive acceptance of new laws and demolished regulations, of bailouts in the of dollars, and the systematic looting of public funds, of lies and deceit. The corporate culture epitomized by Goldman Sachs has seeped into our classrooms, our newsrooms, our entertainment systems, and our consciousness. This corporate culture has stripped us of the right to express ourselves outside of the narrow confines of the established political order. We are forced to surrender our voice. Corporate culture serves a faceless system. It is, as Hannah Arendt wrote, the rule of nobody, and for this very reason, perhaps the least human and most cruel form of rulership. Those who resist, the doubters, outcasts, artists, 
renegades, skeptics, and rebels rarely come from the elite. They ask different questions. They seek something else, a life of meaning. They have grasped Immanuel Kant's dictum, if justice perishes, human life on earth has lost its meaning. And in their search, they come to the conclusion that as Socrates said, it is better to suffer wrong than to do wrong. This conclusion makes a leap into the moral. It refuses to place a monetary value on human life. It acknowledges human life, indeed all life, as sacred. And this is why, as Arendt points out, the only morally reliable people are not those who say, this is wrong, or this should not be done, but those who say, I can't. The greatest evildoers are those who don't remember because they have never given thought to the matter. And without remembrance, nothing can hold them back, Arendt wrote. For human beings, thinking of past matters means moving in the dimension of depth, striking roots, and thus stabilizing ourselves so as not to be swept away by whatever may occur, the zeitgeist or history or simple temptation. The greatest evil is not radical. It has no roots, and because it has no roots, it has no limitations. It can go to unthinkable extremes and sweep over the whole world. There are streaks in my lungs, traces of the tuberculosis I picked up around hundreds of dying Sudanese during the famine I covered as a foreign correspondent. I was strong and privileged and fought off the disease. They were not and did not. The bodies, most of them children, were dumped into hastily dug mass graves. The scars I carry within me are the whispers of these dead. They are the faint marks of those who never had a chance to become men or women, to fall in love and have children of their own. I carried these scars to the doors of Goldman Sachs. I placed myself at the feet of these commodity traders to call for justice because the dead and those dying in slums and refugee camps across the planet could not make the journey. I see their faces. They haunt me in the day and come to me in the dark. They force me to remember, and they make me choose sides. Thank you. What is a cloud over this room right now is what's going on in Iraq mm. and, it, it, and the Middle East. It is a real disaster. But sadly, we elevate people like George H.W. Bush and Henry Kissinger to Ooh. the status Ooh. of elder statesmen. I know. You know, while they commit horrendous crimes. I mean, some of us here in this audience tonight were in El Salvador uh, four years ago to commemorate the death, the assassination by U.S. you know supported troops uh, of Archbishop Romero. So we keep on doing those things. And uh, could you speak on the issue, the the terrible uh, situation that's going on in Iraq. Well, right I mean, now. the tragedy of Iraq is, I mean, it was, it's a war crime. Under, you know, aggression under post Nuremberg laws is a war crime. Preemptive war is a war crime. The worst war crime. And so we not only had no right to go into Iraq or Afghanistan, but we have no right to discuss the terms of the occupation. Uh, and what's happened is that, and as Nuremberg pointed out, this war crime engenders all the evils that come after. We have destroyed Iraq as a unified country. It will never be put back together. Um, we have left probably a million dead. Um, w the Maliki government was beset uh, in the months before by uh, a nonviolent movement that called for social reform, an end to corruption, um, quite a powerful movement throughout the country. 
and the US-backed Maliki government used violence against these nonviolent protesters. And we are seeing that um, that violence does what it always does, uh, push people who attempted to carry out nonviolent reform into the arms of armed movements. Uh, and uh, all of that is, is our curse. I mean, we created this bizarre jihadist entity, Sunni militant group that is, you know, moving on Baghdad. And we created a bankrupt uh, army that is dropping their weapons and fleeing. I mean, it's all a product of what we've done. And the tragedy of Iraq is that, and I had covered, not only was I in the first Gulf War, went into Kuwait with 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, was in Basra during the uprising until I was captured and taken prison, prisoner by the Iraqi Republican Guard. I like to say I was embedded with the Iraqi Republican Guard. <laughs> um, after the war, the weapons, the UN inspection teams destroyed all of the stockpiles of weapons. The sanctions, which of course killed, you know, a few hundred thousand children because medicine couldn't get in, uh, crippled his military. I mean, he couldn't get parts for his tanks. He, he didn't have a military anymore. It was just a shadow of what it was. Um, his, the heir apparent, his son Uday, had been crippled in an assassination attempt. He was spending increasing amounts of time isolated in palaces around the country writing romance novels, if you can believe it. That's what he was doing. The regime was going down. It was not a threat to us. It wasn't a threat to its neighbors. Uh, and, and we are responsible for, for what's happened. And it's, it's just, you know, I mean, it's a, not only just a great strategic blunder, but it is a tremendous moral crime, and, uh, and it, it makes the Bushes, and it makes them, in, you know, under international law, it makes them war criminals.